Good morning, Karen. I didn't get a chance to speak to you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. It really is good to see each of you here today. As we're finding our seats now, I want to share with you greetings. I've really got control of this crowd, don't I? I want to bring you greetings from Creighton Beatty this morning. I had an opportunity to have lunch with Creighton Beatty this past week. He says hello. He loves you. Him and Deb are doing really fine where they're at. And uh, what reminded me uh, of our meeting with Creighton Beatty was he had a chance uh, during the Barnabas Conference to stand up and tell a funny story about his ministry. And it's, it's ironic, uh, if you will, that this morning the verse of Scripture that Tootie quoted from the book of Revelation was part of Creighton's story. He said when he was a young minister trying out for a church, he, he was called upon to pray, and he wanted to include a verse of Scripture in his prayer. And so he chose that verse of Scripture from the book of Revelation. But instead of saying Alpha and Omega, he was so nervous he said, and the alfalfa and omega. I don't know if he got the job or not, but he's doing good, and he sends his love to you and his greetings, and uh, I wanted to extend that to you this morning. What kind of people does God use in his service? What kind of people does God use in his service? service. Now we'll come back to that question in just a minute, but I want us to take a look at some Bible heroes today. And I went around this morning during just before Sunday school during our fellowship time when we have coffee and donuts, and uh, I asked the question, who's your favorite Bible hero? Now we know that who's number 1? Jesus. Okay, that goes without saying, right? Jesus is the hero of the Bible. In fact, this whole book is about Jesus from beginning to end. He's the hero. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that we worship. He's the one that we're going to bow before one day in heaven. And what a glorious day that will be when every knee shall bow and every knee will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a wonderful day that will be. But there's some other heroes in the Bible, and I asked several people, and actually I'm just going to mention four this morning, and of these four, some of them were mentioned this morning as I asked the question. One of them, of course, is Moses, and I think I have a shot of Moses. This is a picture, I guess they had a Polaroid back then, and they took a picture of when he was parting the Red Sea, and uh, the Children of Israel crossed over and what? On what? Dry ground. What a great story that is. I think, you know, if I had another picture, I don't have one. I guess you couldn't go up on the mountain on Mount Sinai with a camera and take a picture. Only Moses was allowed up there and he received from God the commandments uh, that uh, Moses was to use to lead his children. Uh, and so some great stories about Moses. There's another one. What about uh, Joshua? Joshua's an interesting story. You know, Joshua was able, through a prayer and through the need, to actually have the sun and the moon stand still. Joshua, through his prayer and his ministry, was the only one that had ever happened. The actual time stood still. What an amazing, amazing story as God blessed Joshua in his efforts uh, during that time. And then what about Samson with his superhuman strength? The Bible says of Samson in Judges chapter 16 
Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against him. If you remember the story of Samson, he uh, had a little problem with Delilah and he lost his strength, he lost his position, and yet, and now he is in, uh, he's encamped, he's, he's prisoner by the very people that, he, that were fighting against the Lord's people, the Philistines, and now he's being captive, held captive by the Philistines, and he's, his power's gone, his ministry seems like it's gone completely, and so he begins to pray. And here's what he said, please God, strengthen me just one more time. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people. Thus he killed many more Philistines when he died than when he lived. Even in the end of his ministry, he was a true Bible hero. And then, of course, who can forget David? David facing that giant, uh, and that giant was fully armored, and he had a big sword, and he was a big man, and David was just a little boy with a slingshot, and through the power of God, because he stood up for what uh, God believed in and wanted him to, he was able to take that giant down. You know, these are some real Bible heroes. You know, Moses controlled the elements. Uh, he was able to bring about the wind and part the sea so that the children of Israel could cross on dry ground. Joshua stopped time. Samson pushed down buildings and David toppled giants. I mean, we celebrate heroes, don't we, in the Bible. And I think in our culture, we celebrate heroes. I mean, here we are, make America great again, keep America great. We just went through all these different uh, programs that celebrate the Oscars and the Emmys and, and we're always giving people accolades and trophies and wonderful things. We, we like success in the West. We celebrate great people and great happenings in the Bible and in our world. Where are you at in that scenario? Uh, can you personally identify with Moses or Samson or Joshua or David? I didn't do anything like that. Have you ever done anything like that? You know, uh, we just came back from this Barnabas uh, retreat, and uh, it's where the, the, be the best of the best are paraded out on stage to deliver messages and, and to sing and perform and tell funny stories, and, and I mean, just the best of the best. I want to describe uh, some of the keynote speakers and the musicians and the extraordinary talent uh, there at the Barnabas Conference. It was a three-day parade of the best of the best of the best. Uh, they started off um, in one session giving tribute to Wayne Smith. Anybody remember the name Wayne Smith? Uh, just a a, a, a guy who used humor to deliver messages. And he reached so many people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they gave tribute to Wayne Smith, who's passed away. They also gave tribute to Ed Bowsman. Who remembers the name Ed Bowsman? Ed Bowsman, God is just a what? Prayer away. That was his ministry, and, and he was a great man of God. And they did a tribute, actually had his picture up on the stage, on the, on the backdrop. And then uh, they also celebrated uh, and remembered fondly Roger Chambers, who was an extraordinary Bible expositor, formerly the president of um, Florida Christian College and University, and he was just a tremendous guy. And, and we all owe, owe these guys a, a debt of gratitude, to be, to be sure. Our, our favorite preacher, and I mean, guys, he was dynamic. And if I, I want to get this guy here some, one year, somehow, some way, he's young, uh, so he's going to be around a long time unless an automobile or accident or something like that takes him out. Uh, in fact, he's so young and he looks so young that when he got, got up on stage, he said, I remember the first time I spoke at this conference was 2012. My mother dropped me off and 
she let me stay. And so he was a really young guy, but he's a preacher, dynamic preacher, and he's a lawyer. He holds like three different degrees. You know, I leaned in. He was so dynamic. I leaned into Judy during his message, and I said, in the dictionary, right next to the word preacher, there's a picture of Aaron Davis. I mean, he was just that that good I mean he was the best of the best of the best and then they gave awards to a lot of people who had done extraordinary work through the years with ministries like save the children and press which stands for the preacher recruitment and encouragement seminar and so people are coming up on stage they're getting accolades they're delivering messages then there was this one young woman that played the keyboard and sang cowgirl Christian y'all know that song but she sang it so good, it was like I'd never heard it before. It was just a marvelous, and, and she was just fantastic. Now, can you guys, any of you in this room, identify with any of those people? What kind of people does God use in his service? Is it only the best of the best, the best preachers, the best singers? the most popular, the most powerful, the mo most prestigious? Is that the kind of people that God uses to build his church? And if it is, where do I fit in the picture? Well, in Acts chapter 9, there's actually a description of three kinds of people that God uses in his service. Three kinds of people that God uses in his service. One is Paul, one is Aeneas, and one is Tabitha, also known as Dorcas. Now, let me just tell you something. Aeneas is my favorite Bible hero. And you guys maybe never, ever even gave Aeneas a second thought, but he's my hero. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit now we know enough about Paul that I don't need to tell you who he was but it was in Acts chapter 9 that he was converted that's when he was struck down on the road to Damascus he was sent to the city and they prayed over him and he was baptized and calling on the name of the Lord and he he received uh, salvation and we know that Paul went on to be just this great great missionary who brought the gospel of Jesus Christ as far west as you could possibly bring it in those days and because of his ministry you and I are sitting in this room today he was the apostle to the Gentiles so we know a lot about Paul so I'm just going to pick up the story and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Aeneas and Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse 32 and here's what the scriptures say as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydia or Lydda, and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, just stop right there for a minute, because I don't want you to miss this. The man got out of bed, and a whole town was saved. Bob, wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? I mean, just we just get out of bed, and a whole town is saved. Wouldn't that be great? Well, here's Aeneas. Peter heals him. He gets out of bed, and not only Lydda, but also Sharon, a nearby town. All the people turned to the Lord because of Aeneas. We'll talk more about him in a little bit. Verse 36, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. 
Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So we've got this story, three people in the book of Acts, Paul, Aeneas, and Tabitha. I think she preferred Tabitha over Dorcas. That sounds kind of a funny kind of sounded name. She probably preferred Tabitha. But those are the three people uh, that are given to us as examples of the kinds of people that God uses in his service. The healing of Aeneas, interestingly, falls right between Paul's conversion and the raising of Tabitha from the dead. And I personally believe that the Holy Spirit put Aeneas there for a purpose. And I think he put, it, put Aeneas there for you and for me. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Aeneas, but we know a lot about Saul, who became Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles that changed uh, the, the known world through his ministry, the apostle Paul. And we know quite a bit about Tabitha. Paul would become the most influential New Testament character that we find in the Bible. Now, we know that there's been other disciples of Christ and followers of Christ that have done great works and, and had great ministries, and many people have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have been immersed into uh, the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I think of great ministers, and I think uh, about Ajay Law over there at Central India Christian Ministries. I mean, what a tremendous, I think he is someone, I think it was Bob who said, you know, he's the Apostle Paul of, of our day. What a, what a tremendous work he's doing. That whole country is being impacted as a result of his ministry. The Apostle Paul, that kind of guy. The most, single most, influential converted life in the New Testament. And we know a lot about Tabitha just from this little section of the Scriptures. We know that she was uh, a well-loved, and she was a very giving person. We call her a philanthropist. Notice that the comments, as the widows are standing around and they're mourning the death of Tabitha, and they're, they're recalling all of the kind and gracious things that she had done for them. Remember, she made me this gown, and, and she sewed this up for me, and she gave me this, and, and she visited me on this occasion. And, and they're just remembering Tabitha with, the, with these accolades, and they're just just speaking so highly of her. So what do we see? We see somebody who's very powerful and somebody who's very popular. Somebody who was a tremendous speaker and uh, presenter of the gospel of Jesus Christ and somebody who was well-loved by the entire community. Is that you? Is that me? Tabitha was wealthy, giving, generous, and kind. She was kind, the kind of person that every person wanted to be around. In short, again, she was popular. You know, much like the keynote speakers at the Barnabas Convention, Paul and Tabitha were well-known and popular servants of Christ. So if they were still alive today, they would have been keynote speakers keynote people uh, at the Barnabas convention. Paul was powerful. Tabitha was popular. But what about Aeneas? Well, we got to put a P on it. He was paralyzed, right? That's who he was. He was paralyzed. Aeneas lived in Lydda, lost the use of his legs at some point, and had been bedridden for eight years according to Dr. Luke. That's it. That's all we know about Aeneas. 
If paralyzed Aeneas wasn't here in this story, it would drive me, or it might drive you, to one of two places, either pride or despair. What do you mean by that? Well, you'd say, yeah, man, I'm looking at Paul's life, and you know, I, I, I'm that kind of guy. Man, I'm, I'm powerful. I'm persuasive. Uh, people listen to me. I can get things done. You know, God, it's a good thing you and me are having this conversation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very well known, and, and a lot of people respect me. Man, it's a good thing that we're, we're having this con conversation. In fact, I, I'm not only powerful, I'm popular. Look at my friends list. Man, I got 3,000 friends on Facebook and growing. You know, people just want to, they want to talk to me, man. And they answer all my Twitters. You know, they're following me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Man, I'm that kind of guy. God, it's a good thing we're having this conversation because you know what? If you, if you get me and you win me, guess what? You win all my Facebook friends, all my Instagram followers, all my Twitter followers. Man, God, win, win, God. You get me, I get you. Good deal. Pride. Or it could lead you to despair. Wow. Paul. Wow. Tabitha. Paul's good at everything. I'm not good at anything. In fact, I'm not good at anything at all. People tell me that all the time. You're just no good. You're not good at anything. Tabitha. Man, she's got a lot of friends. I wish I had friends like that and nobody calls me nobody comes by to see me man god i get it you use people like paul and you use people like tabitha in your service you don't need me you see pride or despair if the only people you see in that three categories is Paul of, of the two and the only people you see is Paul and Tabitha you're going to be led to either pride or despair because you're either going to be one of those kind of people or you're going to not and if you're not you're going to be left yeah well I guess it's not grace at all God you save powerful people you save popular people I guess grace isn't grace at all and so the Holy Spirit because the Bible is inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit put Aeneas right in the middle of those two examples. Aeneas is a nobody from nowhere that nobody cared about. Through Peter, Jesus said to Aeneas and to the world, God cares. God cares about every single soul, every person, whether they're popular, whether they're powerful, or whether they're paralyzed, and nobody from nowhere, God cares for those people. You know, sometimes I think we celebrate the brightest and the best at the expense of those in the greatest need of love, acceptance, and encouragement. Don't you? I think we need to give more attention to people who maybe don't make a big flash, a big splash in the pool, or a big flash in the pan. People who don't make a lot of noise. People who are just quietly going along, loving the Lord, being faithful, being quiet, just doing their thing. You don't even notice them, but yet God notices them. And that's what Neus tells us about. That's why he's my hero. Aeneas lost the use of his legs. You know, there are things in life that can cause you to be paralyzed other than the loss of your physical legs. What about divorce? How many people are out there in our community that will not come to a church because they have the stigma of divorce hanging over their head and they need the grace of God? How many of them are out there? paralyzed because of their life circumstances you know things happen bad things happen 
and that we live in a fallen world. And you know what? We can't always figure it all out. And tough stuff happens to people. Many people who have been through a divorce feel paralyzed and a- unable to, to walk in service to the Lord. They don't, they don't want somebody like me divorced. What about someone that battles addiction? What a great story we heard this morning. What about somebody who battles addiction, who just doesn't think? They can't get it together. They can't get that monkey off their back. And they're afraid to reach out because they're afraid of the shame and the guilt that would be associated and the judgment that would come from those of us who don't partake of such things and aren't addicted. What about those people? What about people who don't have perfect families and perfect relationships? You know, over and over again at the Barnabas Convention, not only were they talking about all of the wonderful things that these people had done in the past, they were talking about their perfect families. It was like a Facebook shot, you know, one of those snapshots you see on Facebook where my life's perfect and everything's good, but you know and I know that everything's not good all the time, right? I mean, there's no such real thing as a perfect family, but yet they were celebrating, you know, this guy was a great father, a great husband, he's got great kids, and, you know, he, his grandkids aren't even born yet, but they're great too, you know what I mean? It's just like this, this, this parade of people who are do everything just right. And I, and I couldn't help. I mean, I left and I was grateful uh, for these wonderful people who are serving the Lord, and, I, and I'm thrilled, and I can't wait to hear Aaron Davis preach again, and I can't wait to hear that little gal who sang a cowgirl Christian sing again, whatever. And she yodeled and she did it all, man. It was amazing. I, I can't wait. But you know what? I, I, I left also thinking, I said, what about the rest of us? Can God use us? You know, we don't all have perfect families and perfect pitch, and perfect abilities. That's why Aeneas is my favorite Bible hero because God used a nobody from nowhere to win not one town but two towns and all he did was get up out of bed, man. I mean, think about that. God will honor you for getting out of bed and coming to church and sitting down where you're sitting right now. Say amen. God appreciates that. It's not the greatest things that you can do, the biggest, flashiest things. It's those simple, everyday little things that we do. You know, because Aeneas is in the Bible, I can be here sharing the gospel with you today and one day share in eternity with Christ because I'm not a Bible hero. I'm not a Moses or a Samson. Uh, I'm, not even, I'm not any of those things. And you know what? I'm not an Aaron Davis, and I'm not a cowgirl Christian. <laughs> I mean, I'm none of those things, man. I'm just me. And I'm amazed at the fact that God can use me. A nobody from nowhere. Do you know where I'm from? I don't even know where I'm from. I was born in a military family, man. I went to 13 different schools before I graduated from high school. My mother was married four times. My dad was married five times. I come from a broken background. Uh, And and by the way, I didn't hear the gospel till I was 30 years old. And, And when I got a hold of the fact that God could even use one of me in his kingdom, I'm just amazed, and I haven't stopped being amazed, that God cares about us nobodies. And i got to tell you something. I think the work of the kingdom is, is more, better served, and I think more gets done by us nobodies than those superheroes that we parade across the stage all the time. Think about it. Who does the most work for the kingdom of God? Is it the preacher? Is it those big superstars? I mean, who doesn't like Kyle Eidelman? I'm not Kyle Eidelman. You know, I'm glad he's doing great work. But you know what? There's other things that are happening all the time that people, ordinary people, are doing. You know, here's what we always say. Jesus can take ordinary people and do extraordinary things, right? So here we are, ordinary people. All right, I'm I'm in line. All right, it's my turn to do something extraordinary. I'm an ordinary person, and I get up, and it's my turn, and guess what? (laughs) It's not so extraordinary. It's just kind of ordinary. 
Well, here's what I think. I think God takes ordinary people and uses them to do everyday things that impact people's lives through ministry. How about prayer? How about the simple act of getting on your knees? I know it's tough for Phil right now. It's going to be real tough in a couple months when he's got two of them. How about the simple act of getting on your knees or getting in your prayer closet, wherever it is that you pray, and, and you know, picking up the, the prayer concerns list and putting your finger on somebody's name this afternoon. Oh, Lord, I want to I wanna pray for Alma Jean. I know she's suffering with a gout. She's in pain. Lord God, touch her in any way you can. Lord, I want to pray for Mark. And I want to pray for Jenna. Oh, and God, that, that lady I met at the grocery store who just seems so out of sorts about everything. Lord, I don't even know her name, but would you touch her? Let me tell you something. That's ordinary, everyday kind of ministry. And if that wasn't getting done, you know what? The church wouldn't even exist. What about a kind word to a stranger in passing? How about sitting with someone for an hour not to preach them a sermon, not to judge them, not to do anything but just provide company. How many people right now in our nursing homes or our home, uh, you know, confined to their homes need somebody just to come by and sit for an hour? You don't have to do anything extraordinary at all. Just be there. God uses ordinary people to do everyday things in his ministry. You know, those aren't fireworks. Those aren't seen by the multitudes. But isn't God just as pleased with those things as he is with the convention speaker who delivers a home-run sermon and wows the crowd? What about faithfully attending worship service? Man, I, I got to tell you, I'm looking around. I see some empty seats, right? Don't you? Ah, maybe they got the flu. Maybe they're on vacation. Who knows? I don't know. You know, if I call them, am I being passive aggressive? Where were you at church Sunday? Uh, or, you know, how about if, is there some way I can reach out to them and let them know that I, I genuinely miss you and there's a part of me that's missing when you're not in your seat, right? Is there somehow we can do that? How about taking a turn in the nursery? Man, that, that is rough. <laughs> I mean, I got to tell you, man, that's taking one for the team, right? Whew! I'm glad I don't have to do that. Two things, I'm a preacher, and you might miss me. I don't know, maybe you want me to take a turn back there. I don't know. And I'm a guy. And so anyway, is it all right for guys to do nursery? I think it's frowned on. I really do. Don't you guys? I think it's frowned on, I do. How about sharing the truth from God's word with a troubled teen? Is that ministry? You're not going to get paraded across the stage at the Barnabas Convention, but will God honor it? You bet he will. See, no one's going to give you a trophy of recognition for that, but isn't that just as important as a super talented mu musician and singer? impressing and sometimes leaving us yes in envy of their talent man i wish i could sing like that but you know what sharing a good word with a troubled teen is just as important if not more important to god you see Aeneas wasn't any of the things that we tend to celebrate in the church he was a nobody from nowhere yet he touched an entire village and his life was changed by God and I believe through his story we see that Jesus uses ordinary people to do everyday things for his glory I'm curious this morning has God touched you today through the story of Aeneas one last thought about Aeneas he was paralyzed for eight years. Now, Dr. Luke makes it a point to tell us that he was paralyzed for eight years. 
at, at some point, I'll bet you Aeneas gave up. I don't know when. I don't know, was it one year? After a year of being bedridden? After two years? After three years? Man, this, this, is, this is the way my life's going to be for the rest of my life. It's not going to get any better. I've been in this bed for three years. There's no, the doctors have given up on me. My friends don't even come by and see me anymore. The friends that I, I used to have, I'm in this bed and I'm never going to get out of it. How about four years? Five years? I'll bet you. After eight years, he had completely given up and said, this is it. This is my lot in life. Enter the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus can change everything in your life. And I don't know how long you've been paralyzed by the circumstances of your life, how long you've lain in your spiritual bed unable to do anything for the Lord because you feel ill-prepared or inadequate, Jesus can change everything. Jesus needs ordinary people to do everyday things in His service. Brother Ricky, if you'd pray.